my pleasure to welcome you to today's session focused on deterring aggression by major power adversaries, insights from wargaming and analysis, uh, and to welcome our speaker, David Achmanek from uh, the RAND Corporation. Uh, before turning it to Dave, let me just make a, a few words of introduction here. Uh, we at CGSR have been focused on the question of how adversaries think about deterring and defeating the United States and its allies in a major regional war. Uh, and as as some of you from the lab will know, we've been engaged in, in that uh, inquiry since 2015. And we've put a particular priority on understanding the theories of victory that adversaries have and the needed response of the United States and its allies. Well, the RAND Corporation has also put a priority on these questions uh, and has a substantial body of excellent work, uh, some of it utilizing game theoretic and gaming techniques to map out the problem space to understand the operational challenges of the types of wars for which Russia and China have prepared uh, and to explore different operational solutions to those problems. Uh, and uh, this work has been led by uh, Dave Achmanek uh, and was recently summarized in an important um, summary document uh, report uh, issued by RAND. Uh, so Dave's going to talk uh, with with slides about uh, this work and uh, by way of introduction, let me say I had the pleasure of serving with Dave together in the Office of the Secretary of Defense through the first Obama term. Uh, he's been in the Office of the Secretary of Defense in a number of different senior roles. Uh, in, from 2009 to 2014, he was the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Force Policy. Uh, he has also served uh, in the Clinton administration as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Strategy. Uh, he's gone back and forth to the RAND Corporation in a variety of roles, uh, currently as Senior Defense Analyst. Uh, he uh, served as a member of the Foreign Service of the United States from 1980 to 1985. Uh, prior to that, he was an officer in the United States Air Force, having graduated from the United States Air Force Academy. Uh, and he has a master's degree from Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School of International, I'm sorry, of Public and International Affairs. Uh, he also serves as an adjunct professor at Georgetown University. Dave, thanks so much for making the time to do this. We look forward to your remarks. Let me turn it over to you. Um, I, I want to just uh, uh, spend a few minutes uh, setting the stage with a comparison of where we've been in force planning uh, and where we are now. And the primary focus of my remarks will be insights that we've gleaned from several years of wargaming and analysis on, this, on the principal operational challenges posed by the nation's most capable adversaries, specifically China and since 2014, Russia, um, and talk about the implications of those challenges for how we need to be uh, adjusting our force posture, our capabilities, and indeed our, our, our operational concepts for projecting power. Uh, this is a very um, sophisticated audience, so please do not hesitate to ask questions for clarification as I go along. I will leave plenty of time for an open-ended discussion at the end, but I'm, I'm, I'm very open to your questions and even indeed challenges as we go along. So uh, Katie, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, I'll just make the perhaps obvious observation that we're not in a good place. Um, uh, the military balance, certainly with China, has deteriorated dramatically since the turn of the century when they started pouring uh, uh, really impressive resources into the modernization of their forces uh, and, and, and getting after the uh, requisite capabilities required for what they call a counter-intervention strategy. Um, as, as force planners, we had the luxury of focusing on China for a while, and then in 2014, Russia invaded Ukraine twice, and suddenly uh, NATO was confronted with the possibility of actual uh, use of force 
uh, at scale in the European uh, region, which came as a shock to many of us who had the hope, if not the expectation, that Russia had gotten uh, to the point where that was, if not unthinkable, at least highly unlikely. And so uh, since the early 2000s, we've been wargaming uh, conflict with China. Since 2014, we've been uh, wargaming the possibility of conflict between NATO and Russia. And it comes as news to a surprising number of people in the US defense community that when we wargame these scenarios, blue often loses. Um, uh, and particularly in the Baltic scenarios uh, of a Russian attack, it's not close. Now, uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll want to uh, talk a little bit at some point when we're together today about whether we have been overestimating Russian military capabilities based on what we've seen the Russian forces be unable to do in Ukraine. I've got some thoughts on that, although obviously it's early days. So, but 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 I will I will stand by the assertion that the military balance in Europe vis-a-vis -vis NATO and Russia on the eastern flank of the alliance is not satisfactory and and that we do not today have what I as a force planner regard as a credible posture to deter Russian aggression. And it's been now, right, uh, um, eight years or so since uh, we've been focused on the Russia problem and we have not turned the corner. And uh, likewise, in the two decades that we've seen a rise in China, the, the balance is continuing to deteriorate from our perspective. Let me, um, let me uh, go ahead to the next slide, please, Katie. And let me um, put a little meat on these bones. So it's common these days, as you all know, to refer to military operations as occurring in five domains, air, sea, land, space, and cyber. And uh, in the post-Cold War era, by which we mean roughly starting in 1991 with Operation Desert Storm and the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, go to the next slide, please, Katie. The United States, uh, US Armed Forces had confidence in dominating all five domains of warfare. Uh, these are a couple of pictures from Operation Desert Storm. At the top, you see a small portion of the Iron Mountain that we built uh, in Dahran and elsewhere on the Saudi Peninsula in the five months leading up to Operation Desert Storm. Uh, at the bottom, you see um, a Marine Air Wing uh, arrayed at Sheikh Issa Air Base in Bahrain during Operation Desert Storm. This is what dominance looks like. You get a uh, leisurely amount of time to deploy your force to the theater. You can pile it up in massive concentrations with confidence that it's not going that that deployment is not going to be seriously disrupted by your adversary, and that you know yes Saddam had some Scud missiles and things that could reach into our rear areas, but that was not considered to be a serious threat to our ability to build combat power in the theater. Go to the next slide, please. And this is also what dominance looks like. On the top, you see the Battle of Kafji that didn't happen uh, in the middle of the night during i think it was probably late january early february 1991 saddam decided he was tired of sitting there and taking the punishment from the air campaign he wanted to uh, change things up and he sent an armored column southward towards saudi arabia that column was detected by joint stars in the middle of the night a10s and f15s were uh, vectored toward it they used onboard sensing systems to detect the armored column and they, they wasted it before it got close to, uh, to its objective. The bottom, of course, is a, is a picture of a portion of the highway of death leading north out of Kuwait City in the final hours of Operation Desert Storm. Um, this event, this demonstration of US military capabilities in Desert Storm and subsequent conflicts to include in, in, the, in the Baltics and in Afghanistan, um, and by the way, to include our, our mistaken bombing of the Chinese embassy in Belgrade in 1999, it's fair to say uh, scared the crap out of the Chinese and others. And they began working very hard to equip themselves with capabilities and doctrine 
so that they would not be subjected to this kind of dominance by a modern military. Um, the other effect of these operations was to foster a sense of complacency uh, within the United States, certainly in the defense community, but the public at large about the dominance of US military capabilities. Uh, and, and I would say it uh, contributed to putting blinders on our ability to recognize when the trends began to turn unfavorable for us. Go, go to the next slide, please, Katie. And now um, it, it's fair to say that all five domains of warfare, air, sea, land, space, and cyber will be contested, certainly in any fight with China and Russia, uh, potentially at least selectively in fights with less capable adversaries such as North Korea and Iran. So uh, what does this mean? How do we adapt to it? Um, can we continue to expect to be able to project power in the face of these kinds of capabilities? Next slide, please. Just to put a little finer point on it, this is a portrayal of the battlefield that confronted General Schwarzkopf and company in January of 1991 when they kicked off Operation Desert Storm. Those red circles you see inside Iraq are roughly depicting the coverage provided by the, uh, uh, by the longer range SAM systems available to the Iraqis. These are SA-2, SA-3 systems of 1960s vintage. We understood their electronics and characteristics very well. We were, uh, our forces were well suited to, to, to uh, countering those systems and we lost very few aircraft to surface to air fires. We lost no aircraft as far as I'm aware to air to air fires. Uh, faintly on here, you can see circles reaching out from Iraq towards Saudi Arabia, toward Israel. Uh, that dotted line represents the longest range of the Al Hussein missile, which was a local Iraqi variant of the Scud, um, highly inaccurate. The CEP was about a kilometer or more, fairly small warhead. Yes, they did launch some of these at Israel, at, at uh, cities and bases in Saudi Arabia. We actually lost a good number of people in a barracks in Dahran from a Scud missile strike, but, but, but by and large, this was not regarded as a serious threat to our basing, to the tempo of operations uh, during that war. Next slide, please. Well, that was then, this is now. Um, those red circles you see in China and on its borders represent the effective ranges of, their, of Chinese long range SAMs against fourth generation non-stealthy aircraft. There are both land-based SAMs and naval SAMs, and you, you see the reach of those naval SAMs from surface combatants that would be in the Taiwan Strait um, on Luyang and Renhai uh, uh, surface combatants. And, uh, and the circles you see reaching out from China represent the ranges of a series of ballistic and cruise missiles that the Chinese have deployed uh, with, which enables them to strike with effectiveness military targets well beyond Guam. And now we're talking CEPs in the single digits or low double digits of meters. And we're talking not hundreds of weapons. In some cases, we're talking thousands of weapons. So you're not going to see Iron Mountains. You're not going to see aircraft based wingtip to wingtip at air bases in the region. Uh, we have got to figure out other ways to project power survivably into this environment. So um, with that as background, let me dig in a little bit to the two scenarios that we focus on in our war gaming and analysis. Next slide, please. The first, of course, is a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. Um, in such a conflict, as I mentioned, Chinese forces have the capability to strike land bases as well as surface combatants like our carrier strike groups out to ranges of 1500 nautical miles or more. That range greatly exceeds the unrefueled range or radius of uh, aircraft, fighter aircraft on our carriers and at air bases uh, in the region. They have, as I showed earlier, the capability to defend the airspace over the Taiwan Strait with dense overlapping coverage of very modern SAM systems uh, as well as increasingly capable uh, fighter forces. We must expect that our uh, information uh, uh, domain will be seriously disrupted by Chinese attacks, both kinetic and non-kinetic. 
Uh, certainly in space, they have the capability to destroy physically satellites in low Earth orbit and to disrupt uh, them with jamming and uh, dazzling capabilities. Uh, we will, the electromagnetic spectrum will be highly contested um, for communications. And of course, we know that the Chinese are investing heavily in offensive cyber capabilities. So we can expect our networks and our databases to be attacked, uh, certainly even before the outset of, of kinetic hostilities. Uh, the undersea domain remains an area of relative advantage for the United States, but the Chinese are aware of that. They're getting after it with improved maritime patrol aircraft, uh, improved submarines of their own, and uh, improved towed sonar arrays for their surface, surface fleet. And the objective of all this, through, um, uh, according to their doctrine, is not to defeat the United States outright, but rather to hold at arm's length our power projection capabilities, uh, disrupt our deployment to the theater, and suppress the operational tempo of our forces in the theater for a time sufficient to allow them to open a window of opportunity to accomplish their principal operational objectives, which of course in this case are to put about 100,000 PLA soldiers on the island of Taiwan, overrun Taiwan's defenses and forcibly uh, depose the government there. <clears throat> Next slide, please. And what we see in our war gaming is uh, that things typically don't go well for blue, particularly when the blue team uh, um, uh, employs the forces available to it using the legacy operational concepts that succeeded so well against the junior varsity adversaries of the post-Cold War era. Uh, our our land-based fighters and bombers, um, our uh, carrier strike groups typically suffer heavy losses before they even get off the ground. Uh, those that do survive uh, find it uh, find that they are unable to suppress that air defense over the battle space. And, and because of that, the systems that we typically use to gain uh, an, an awareness of the operation, um, our, our ISR systems are compromised. AWACS, Joint Stars, Rivet Joint, uh, Global Hawk cannot operate at ranges that allow them to employ their sensors against enemy forces on Taiwan or in the Strait. And as I mentioned before, our space-based sensors are under attack as well. And so uh, what we see is our blue teams bringing only limited combat power to bear in a highly contested environment when and where it's needed. Uh, next slide, please. As a result, uh, Chinese forces most of the time, and we're talking now, say 2025 type scenarios, 2030, do create that window of opportunity to allow them to land a sizable force onto the island. How long uh, the Taiwans can hold out, what their will to fight is, uh, whether we can meaningfully reinforce them during the fight, these are pretty nebulous questions that our war gamers find it difficult to get high confidence on. But, um, but, but the overall trend is, is such that, that uh, we as force planners are very concerned that we do not today have a credible deterrent against this against this kind of threat. And we not only lose, we lose in a costly way. You'll see hundreds of uh, dead airplanes as a result of this, mostly killed on the ground, and, and thousands of casualties to American servicemen and women. Um, and now, uh, so this is, as I said, we're not in a good place. Um, how do you reverse these trends? It's, it's, it's about more than just buying better stuff. Uh, and it's about more than changing our basing posture, although those two are necessary ingredients of a future uh, US defense posture. It gets down to the, the, the scope and extent of this challenge is such that we have to actually figure out a new way to fight, a new way to project power, a new way to engage enemy forces operating underneath this anti-access area denial umbrella, if you will. So that's a thumbnail sketch of the operational challenges associated with defending Taiwan. Let's go to the next slide and talk for just a minute about the Baltic scenario. So in the fall of 2014, 
again, when Moscow demonstrated their willingness and ability to use military power at scale to forcibly change borders in Europe, it came as a bit of a shock to the system. As a force planner, um, we, we did not have Russia on our radar screen after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Again, the expectation was that while our relationship with Russia would be rocky at times, they were in the larger scheme of things on a path toward reform uh, and certainly um, not in a position to meaningfully challenge the rules-based order that, 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 you know, that ruled out this sort of aggression. Um, so, so even as we were struggling to uh, reverse unfavorable trends vis-a-vis -vis China, this challenge got added to our to-do list. Um, the uh, invasion of Crimea and then of the Donbas region of Ukraine came just after the 2014 Quadrennial Defense Review was published. And in retrospect, we, and I was part of that team, should have asked for a redo because this is not a trivial addition to the, the tasks being levied upon US armed forces. Nevertheless, um, it is what it is. We began uh, assessing the military balance on the eastern flank of the alliance. We chose the Baltic states because they are manifestly the most exposed members of the alliance to possible Russian aggression, both because of their geo geographic proximity to Russia, the fact that they are former so-called republics of the Soviet Union, and the fact that Estonia and Latvia both have sizable Russian-speaking minorities. Um, so um, in the course of our war gaming, we came to understand what a Russian invasion operational concept might look like. And it's basically like this. We're talking on the order of 40 to 50 battalion tactical groups that could be mustered within a period of a couple of weeks on the borders of NATO. Um, their main effort would be through the center uh, going toward Riga in Latvia with a possible supporting attack in Estonia. Uh, they would work very hard to keep NATO air power from disrupting this offensive, relying heavily on their IADs, integrated air defense, meeting their long range SAMs, and also fighter aircraft and attacks on our air bases to try and keep our air forces on the ground, just as the Chinese do with their strikes on our bases. And they have substantial means for reaching into NATO's rear areas with cruise missiles to target our logistics, our command and control, and our power projection hubs. The goal of this, just like the Taiwan's, is not a comprehensive defeat of NATO, which they acknowledge is more powerful than the Russian Federation, but rather to open a window of opportunity to confront us with a fait accompli after a few days of intensive military operations, during which they would hope to occupy probably Latvia as well as Estonia, and then, um, and then again, confront us with that situation. Um, next slide, please. And again, just to cut to the chase, um, we find in our war gaming that the Red Forces are able to pretty much accomplish this operational objective with, uh, out much, without much risk of, uh, of seriously being challenged by NATO. Um, they, have, they have the advantage of space and time. Uh, NATO is not postured to rapidly uh, uh, match the combat power on the ground that Russia can, can amass on the borders of the Baltic states. It's better now than it was in 2014, 2015, 2016. We do have multinational battalions stationed in the Baltics. We have a rotational U.S. armor brigade that's generally in Poland. Since the recent invasion of Ukraine, we've seen some temporary plus ups in U.S. and NATO forces for the defense of the eastern flank, but still, uh, the overall military balance is not favorable. They have massive artillery superiority over NATO in this. And as we've seen in the Ukraine operation, they're not shy about unleashing that artillery rather indiscriminately on military as well as civilian uh, targets. Their integrated air defense is not quite as formidable as China's, but it's no slouch. Um, and again, they've got various tools to disrupt our space-based and airborne ISR, our command and control, and our rear area operations with deep strikes with, again, not the same 
uh, impressive inventory of precision guided long range weapons as China has, but certainly sufficient to disrupt our, our rear area activities. Yes, in the last 100 days, they've drawn down the stocks of their uh, precision guided weapons considerably. And with the trade embargoes that we're putting on Russia, it may be quite some time, perhaps a decade or more, before they're able to reconstitute those inventories. So the gaming I'm showing you was conducted prior to the experience of, of Ukraine over the last uh, four months or so. Okay, let me pause here and ask if there are any questions or challenges um, at this point. I see a, uh, oop, I saw a fleeting question in the chat, but I wasn't able to read it. Please, um, Katie, if you can uh, allow people to pipe up if they have questions. Uh, I can put it into play. Does, does the geographic position of Kaliningrad pose particular difficulties in terms of defense, or is the exclave small enough to not be of great concern? <clears throat> Short answer is yes. Uh, for those who don't know, Kaliningrad is at the bottom left here. It is a piece of Russia that lies between Poland and Lithuania. It is bristling with modern long-range SAM systems. <clears throat> and one of the problems that the Blue Force has trying to get at these columns coming through uh, Latvia and Estonia is that the air defense bubble created by those systems in Kaliningrad extends over northeastern Poland and the southern Baltic Sea. So our blue teams try to suppress that air defense in Kaliningrad in the opening days of a conflict. Uh, the, the, at the unclassified level, the principal weapon that we have for suppressing those SAMs is the AGM-88 Han missile. It's a radar homing supersonic missile. It is actually outranged by the S-400 and longer range systems. And so that's a bad situation to be in if you're a harm shooter. So our, our, our blue forces blunt their picks, trying to suppress the air defense in Kaliningrad so that they can get at those advancing armor columns. And in the days it takes them to do that, Russia is already on the outskirts of Tallinn and or Riga. So yes, Kaliningrad is a problem for us. And let, <laughs> let me also give you the opportunity here to comment on whether uh, the experience of Russian forces inside Ukraine changes the assessment of what Russian forces can do in a Baltic contingency. It does. Um, and we're still evaluating um, what lessons from Ukraine would be relevant to a Baltic scenario and what wouldn't. I can give you some early insights from that. Uh, one is that uh, both unclassified and other reporting suggest that the Russian general staff uh, and interestingly, the uh, the FSU, the um, Russian intelligence entities that actually planned the Ukraine operation, seriously underestimated Ukraine's will to fight. They thought that um, they, <laughs> they apparently actually believed that some elements of the Ukrainian population would welcome the Russian forces as liberators. They felt that Zelensky and his government would be feckless and would uh, evacuate Kiev, <clears throat> that they'd be able to overrun Kuwait's defenses in a matter of days and overthrow the government. Uh, we have no reason to believe that Russian military planners would likewise underestimate NATO's will to fight. They know that the Poles, the, the, the Balts, detest the Russians. They know that NATO forces have a high level of readiness and, and competency. So if they would, just, would decide in some future date <clears throat> to attack NATO with force, they know they would have a fight on their hands. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we would expect to see a, a more carefully planned operation. We'd expect to see a much heavier level of effort to suppress our aircraft sortie generation. Um, and these are very short uh, lines of communication. It's only 160 kilometers from Piskov in, in, in Western Russia to Riga. Um, um, uh, and, and, and while we have seen serious problems with logistics and sustainment in the Kuwait operation, um, moving that short distance is not that big of an operational logistical challenge. So uh, more to be said on that. 
a lot of work to be done in the coming months uh, on assessing the, the meaning of the Ukraine operation, but I'll leave it at that for now, if I may. All right, there's nothing else in the chat function at the moment. Would you like to proceed? Yes, thanks, Brad. So let's go to the next slide, please. So we have a situation here. Um, our legacy approach to, con to power projection consistently fails when attempted against China and Russia. We see serious gaps in the capabilities that current and programmed U.S. forces bring to bear in these scenarios. And, um, and, and so we're confronted with the need to figure out, as I said before, a new way to fight. There are efforts going on throughout the department to do that. The Joint Staff J7 has an effort now that's been going on for a couple years on a new joint warfighting concept. RAND has done a lot of the wargaming for J7 to help them evaluate that evolving concept. Uh, Air Force, Army, Marine Corps, and Navy all have futures organizations that are, that are doing similar work. Um, it's fair to say that there is not yet a consensus on a new innovative approach to warfighting. However, uh, on this chart and subsequent charts, uh, I'm capturing what appear to be the main elements of that still nascent concept. It begins with posture. Um, whether you're talking about Desert Storm, the wars against Serbia, Afghanistan, etc., all of those wars were fought from the U.S. perspective from an expeditionary posture. The bulk of the U.S. and allied force that was committed to the operation came from somewhere else uh, prior to or during the operation. Um, so that fairly light posture that we have forward, which has been deemed adequate for deterring aggression by regional adversaries, is manifestly inadequate to, to the challenges posed by China and Russia. I mentioned the five months that it took to build that Iron Mountain in CENTCOM before we did Desert Storm. We might have only five days to deploy the force that would be needed, that would be called upon to blunt aggression by China or Russia. We are not postured for that. So we've got to find ways to have more combat power uh, deployed in ways that can be brought to bear within hours or days of a decision to intervene, not weeks or months. That said, this has to be done in an environment where our forward bases can be subject to intensive attack by accurate ballistic and cruise missiles. Um, so putting more F-15s at Kadena you know, uh, um, uh, piling up uh, warehouses of pre-positioned equipment in the Baltics is leading with your chin. Um, so we've got to find ways for those forces, early engaging forces to be postured in ways that are beyond the reach of the enemy, undersea, at long range, dispersed, hardened, defended, etc. cetera. Two, or, and so that's zero. <laughs> Number one, then, we have to posture ourselves to reach into the contested zones created by enemy anti-access area denial capabilities from the very outset of hostilities. This is foreign to U.S. military planners. When we fought Desert Storm, the first several days were devoted to breaking the enemy's air defense, disrupting his command and control so that we had dominance over the battle space. And having established that, we then went after the center of gravity, which was the Iraqi army. We will not have that time in these wars against China or Russia. We have to reach into that contested zone from the very outset before we have air superiority, while our space assets are under attack, while our command and control is being attacked, and nevertheless find the enemy and engage the enemy. Not easy to do, but we have some thoughts on how to do that. Next, we have to be able to more survivably generate and sustain combat power. That means not losing 100 airplanes on the ground to enemy missiles in the first four or five days of this war. But again, posturing the force so we are less vulnerable to those enemy attacks. Some of that force will be deployed within what we call the threat ring, the range of enemy missiles. Some of it will be deployed well beyond it, specifically in our heavy bomber force, which rather than operating from Guam, is gonna to need to operate from places like Australia, Alaska, Hawaii. Um, and then finally, um, if we are able to what the, do what the strategy calls for, which is blunt the enemy aggression, 
prevent them from imposing the territorial fait accompli on us, but in English, keeping the PLA off of Taiwan in numbers, keeping the Russian military forces out of NATO territory, we're then in a position to more methodically draw down the enemy's combat power elsewhere. Um, and, and over time, convincing the enemy leadership that the longer this conflict goes on, the worse off they are. This will then lay the basis for a negotiated termination of hostilities. This appears to be a viable approach to power projection. However, today's force does not have the capabilities or the posture to execute it. The force we will be fielding in 2027 which is the end of the current fighter, also will not have the capabilities required to execute and support this operational concept. So business as usual will not work. We need to innovate. Let me uh, say a little bit more about the demands of this operational concept. Next slide, please. Um, we have some thoughts about how to reach into this contested zone. Let's say for the sake of argument that we can't rely on space-based ISR to tell us where the targets are. Let's say as well, we don't have air superiority over the over the battle space. And here we'll use the Taiwan scenario as an example. <clears throat> One promising way of nevertheless surveying that battle space is to overwhelm the enemy defense with large numbers of inexpensive uh, sensor platforms. Uh, here I'm, I'm talking about unmanned aerial vehicles, which could fly from southern Japan, from the Philippines, from Taiwan itself. Uh, in numbers uh, up to a thousand, and we invite the enemy to shoot their SAMs at these, we will repopulate the battle space faster than he can attrit it. The UAVs can be supplemented by other means of observing the battle space, such as sauna buoys, uh, submersibles, um, and um, special operations forces deployed on the western coast of Taiwan. If these sensors can share data in real time, <clears throat> and uh, use those data to identify the targets of greatest interest, then it's not that difficult to uh, generate the combat power required to kill the invasion. There could be 2,000 ships deployed in the Taiwan Strait as a covering force for the amphibious invasion. We only need to sink the most important of those, say 250, 300. If you can sort the wheat from the chaff, Sinking 300 ships in 24 hours is well within the realm of possibility, provided we posture ourselves credibly for that. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. So some thoughts about how to generate that combat power. I mentioned the potential of our bomber force. Um, the United States has 96 uh, combat-coded bombers today, B-1s, B-52s, B-2s. They are capable of reaching across the Pacific Ocean with a modicum of refueling support and delivering precision guided weapons into the battle space. Uh, the trouble is they don't have those weapons. I think in the last budget submission, the Air Force bought something on the order of 18 long range anti-ship cruise missiles, El Razum. We need about a thousand. <laughs> So at that rate of procurement, in 50 years, we'll be in a good place. No, we've got to fix that. Um, now, uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, the other interesting capability being uh, explored by the Air Force is um, called pelletized munitions. Uh, with a simple uh, retrofit that doesn't involve changing the avionics on the jet, uh, C-17s and selected C-130s can be configured to drop uh, weapons like the Jasmine ER, like the El Razum from standoff. That could substantially increase the punch we're able to bring to bear from distance in the critical early days of this conflict. Again, we've got to buy the inventory of the standoff weapons, and we have to have that targeting grid to, to ensure that the weapons delivered into the battle space are going after the right things. Uh, next slide, please. The Navy has ideas about how to enhance its ability to reach into this battle space survivably. We have the world's best attack submarines in the Virginia class, and we have four um, Ohio class SSGNs that can deliver 154 cruise missiles each. Unfortunately, those Ohio class boats are aging out of the inventory over the next five to seven years. 
uh, and the and the Virginia class boats cost about two billion dollars a piece, so they're expensive, and most of them are not based forward. Uh, one way to enhance our attack capacity from forward undersea vehicles is uh, unmanned large diameter underwater vehicles like the one shown here. You can put 18 or so uh, maritime strike tactons or SM6 or other weapons into these things. Uh, you can uh, home port them in Yakuska. They can be underwater most of the time. The Chinese will have great difficulty finding them. It looks like a very promising way to increase our attack potential in these critical early days. Next slide, please. I mentioned the threat to our air bases. Um, the Air Force has been slow to invest in some very prosaic things that can increase the resiliency of their forward air bases. I'm showing here at the bottom um, ex expeditionary shelters. Uh, these are semi-portable, takes a day or so to set them up, um, but they're capable of protecting aircraft personnel and materiel from uh, bomblets, from depicum like uh, submunitions. That can greatly increase the price to attack our air bases. Now, instead of a single missile engaging dozens of aircraft parked in the open, that single missile can at best kill one airplane at a time that's protected in this way. Other simple things like fuel bladders can be used to make fuel more resilient. Um, uh, hardened munition storage. Uh, at the top, I'm showing the IFPIC system, which uh, is a cruise missile defense weapon the Army's been developing very slowly, I would say, for a period of years. Um, in our modeling, it does very well in intercepting subsonic cruise missiles at bases. So uh, yes, is this expensive? Uh, in an absolute sense, yes. You know, we're talking um, tens of millions of dollars per airbase. Uh, in the greater scheme of things, if you're protecting a hundred million dollar airplane with a one million dollar shelter, I would I would regard that as a bargain. Next slide, please. Um, one more. So I'm sorry. Go, yeah. Um, um, I want to say a little bit about this. That that picture you see there is of the XQ58. It's an unmanned uh, jet, flies about Mach 0.8, has a range of a couple thousand miles. The Air Force is flying this now as a prototype. It has about a 1,200 pound payload. Um, it's about half the size of the next F-16. Why do we like this? Because it can be launched and recovered without needing a runway. Think of it as a Scud missile on a mobile transport uh, that's not ballistic, but cruise, and it's not a one-way system. It comes back to you, lands with the parachute. You can reload it with fuel and weapons and send it back into the fight. This to us looks like a very promising approach to making our forward posture more resilient. We will never be able to protect runways against hundreds of missiles that are highly accurate, unless and until we get some dramatic breakthrough in the capability capabilities and cost effectiveness of, of active defenses. Fielding large numbers of this type of, of aircraft puts the scud hunting problem on red. For those who don't know, in Desert Storm, we tried very hard to hunt down the scud missile uh, tells that were running around Southern Iraq. That was desert terrain, we had complete air superiority. We devoted thousands of sorties to it. We found almost none. And so I wanna create that problem for our adversaries. The Army's also doing this, the Marine Corps is doing this as well with mobile artillery units that can mount rockets like ATACMs or Maritime Strike Tactons. I think that's a very promising approach for generating combat power within the threat ring, if you will. We also like smaller versions of the XQ-58. We're talking one-tenth the, the, the gross weight uh, as the as being the sort of UAV we would use to constitute that sensing grid that I talked about before. Uh, last slide, please. So um, I want to emphasize that none of the innovations I've called for, whether it's the runway independent UAVs, the sensing grid, the, the runway, the air based resiliency things, the un un unmanned underwater vehicles, 
None of these are high tech. We're building them now. It's a question of focus and sustained focus. Um, and, and compared to, the, in the greater scheme of things, they're also not that expensive. I don't need half the defense budget to go toward these innovative capabilities and concepts to make them a reality. Um, we just need to get after it and, and make others in the defense community, particularly on Capitol Hill, understand both the urgency and the need for change and innovation and the fact that, the, that, that a new way of fighting is emerging and, and, and can be enabled by things that are within our reach now, if not totally within our grasp. And that's, that's uh, the extent of my prepared remarks. We, I, I, if we go to the next slide, I'll just allow myself one. This is a cartoon from the New Yorker, which is not known as being on the cutting edge of the defense blogosphere. But in the caption, uh, as you can tell from the title, has one general saying to the other, can we move the piece representing ourselves a little farther away from the battle? So even the New Yorker understands now the challenges posed by A2AD. So I think it's time the rest of the defense community got with it. <laughs>